you are in for a treat. Greg Reed is on the show. So many great nuggets come from this. You're going to want to take some notes, watch it twice. Let's tune in. Thanks so much for tuning in to Waz Up San Diego. Today I am joined by Greg Reed. What? A local legend here, born and raised San Diego. That's right. Uh, it's rare to get two in the same room at the same time. <laughs> Best-selling author, published in over 70 books, founder of The Secret Knock, yeah. keynote motivational yeah. speaker, one of the best storytellers I've ever kind of seen on camera. All right, thank you. So grateful to have you on the show. Hey, Greg. and by the way, we are kind of like an anomaly, like Bigfoot. It's a Bigfoot sighting, two in the same room at the same time at the same place. Uh, actually, three of them you can't see. Them. Holy uh, smokes! From San Diego. That is an anomaly to say the least. It, it's so funny because it's like three of us and we'll all be at the bar and it's three of my buddies from yeah. local from here and they're like, where are you guys from? Like San Diego. No. Where are you from? Exactly. Like, Originally. No. First book, most iconic book, I would say, is The Millionaire Mentor. How did that kind of, that platform jumpstart your career? Yeah, I've been published now in over 100 books, oh my God. 45 different languages around the world, and it began with that book, The Millionaire Mentor. And people always ask, it's my favorite, and it is because of one reason. Because without it, I never would have done the other 99. See, when I grew up in San Diego, I wasn't a great student. I got a D in English. I can't spell. <laughs> I'm dyslexic. I can't read. Play me words with friends, you'll win every time. And when I did that book, you write something called the query letter. It says who you are, what's your message, why are you an expert who's going to read your book. I was turned down by 268 publishers in a row for my first book. Wow. And the 269th one said, we'll do it. Just change the title, the beginning, the middle, and the end. <laughs> <laughs> and I took their counsel, and I got a great ghostwriter, and they took my words and crafted them in a way people wanted to read it, went on to become a world phenomenon. Here we are today. Wow. So I guess kind of the story behind it is take that first step, take the plunge, yes. and you never know where it's going to go. It's about stickability. It's about having your eye on the prize, but being willing to adapt and adjust along the process. I agree. And, and stickability, it, it is, it's so important, so close to my heart, because I see so many of my friends who just kind of start something and quit. Yes. They, they, you, oh, I'm going to, uh, a workout <laughs> is a perfect example. Yeah. Start doing it for a week or two, and then it just kind of gets hard. It's like, oh, one of my sons got sick and I can't do it, yada, yada. But it's the same thing with everything across life. You know, are there any, you know, from interviewing 70 plus or countless amounts of millionaires and billionaires, mm. What are some of the great nuggets from them that you think kind of help them be more stickable? It is the adaptability and adjustability that makes someone go from a dreamer to a realist. And what it is, I remember the first time when I wrote the book, Stickability, okay. I interviewed a guy named Marty Cooper. He invented the cell phone. And I sat down with him. He's in Solana Beach, by the way. And I asked him a question. I go, what does stickability mean to you? And he said, stickability has to be parallel with flexibility. He okay. says, if you're not willing to adapt and adjust, you get stuck. And he told a story about a spider monkey. He said, in the rainforest, you can't harpoon it, spear it, catch it. It's too wiry. One hunter figured it out. He took a heavy log, drilled a tiny hole, and dropped a peanut inside. Left it at the base of the jungle, and the monkey would smell the nut. Come down from the treetop, reach his hand inside, grab a hold of the nut, and then his fist becomes so big he can't pull it back out and become anchored to the log. Now, all he's got to do is let go, but he's holding on to it with dear life, thinking that, I nut want that is nut. nutrition. <laughs> the hunter comes by an hour later, captures the elusive spider monkey. Wow. The question is, are we holding on to our own nut in life? But it could be in the form of a job or a deal or a house or a car. And what we think is saving us, just like the monkey thought the nut was, could also be the thing that's leading to our own demise. Sometimes we have to have the courage to simply let go so we can adapt to live to fight another day. Gotcha. And that really ties in a little bit with kind of like the three feet from gold story. Absolutely. As well, to where it's some people. But you're just name dropping all my books. Oh, I like this. I this is the best interview ever. Yes. Well, my I, kid might get some new shoes. I like it. <laughs> well, three from gold, because it kind of goes hand in hand with that. It's there's some people who kind of start, start and will continue for a yeah. long time. But 
it's just the laying one brick at a time to create that major, major foundation. And well, you never know when it's going to hit. First, there's a dream. Then there's a challenge. And then comes a victory. Okay. Unfortunately, almost everyone quits in the challenging times. They give up literally three feet away before the miracle can happen. So I realized for myself, you have to have that stickability, have the eye on the prize, like we said, but also be open and willing to find a new way to make it happen. I remember Chewit Cathy, founder of Chick-fil-A. I said, I want to be a billionaire like you. And he said, well, then stop planning so much. What? That's what I said. And I go, what are you talking about? That goes against everything we were taught. And he says, last year you had a lot of plans. I go, yeah? Yeah. How'd that work out for you? He goes, five years ago you had a master plan. About the same way. Exactly. He says, you'll hit a goal because you're creative. He goes, but I guarantee it didn't go as expected. He goes, look Great. for and capitalize on unexpected opportunities. And he gave an example. He says, if I'm at home on my sofa... And I get, want to get to the end of the street. That's my goal. That's my stickability. He goes, a planner is going to plan every step where they're going to pause, take a break, and mm -hmm. probably get caught up in analysis paralysis. He goes, I'm going to look for opportunity. Did a kid Along leave, the way. Did a kid leave a skateboard or a bicycle out? I'll wave down a neighbor driving by, hitch a ride. He goes, either way, I'll get to my goal. I just don't mind how it has to happen. Gotcha. It doesn't matter how you get to the nope. end result. It just... And that's crazy because when you say don't have a plan because everybody's taught in life, yes, have goals. And these are some of the key actions that are going to help you achieve that goal. I think it's a strategy is what ah, the key is, right? Okay. So the whole idea, again, you know, any famous boxer, I remember Evander Holyfield when I was interviewing him. And it's that old famous quote says, you can practice, you can analyze, you can prepare. But as soon as you get punched in the face, all that, all goes, that out goes out the, out the window. window. Yep, I get it. And he is a big visualization guy, too, I believe. Oh, my gosh. He was the greatest interview I ever did. I wow. mean, it was one shot. He, he was a, a wordsmith, a poet. And I asked him, I go, how did you win more heavyweight championships than anyone else in history? And he said, I have a higher standard. I said, what do you mean? He goes, in sports, I showed up early, left late, invented exercises. I had a higher standard. I won more championships. He goes, where could you be in your own business if you had a higher standard? I said, but didn't it hurt being in a fight? He says, yeah, but when you're in a fight, you don't focus on the pain. You don't focus on the blows. If you do, you end up on your back knocked out. But that's what people do outside the ring. They focus on gas prices, war, the coronavirus, and then they wonder why they never become a champion. Mm -hmm. And he pulled me in tight. An Adonis of a man missing half an ear bitten off by Tyson, <laughs> right? And he says, you know what the funny thing is? He says, when you do win the championship, he says, everyone comes to their feet and they chant your name. They raise your hand in victory, and a guy puts a big shiny belt around your waist. And at that moment, and at that second, you don't feel even one of the punches you took along the journey. No, you just, lit. oh my, and that is so, so true. I love it. So who are some of the other most amazing interviews you've ever had? Well, I've had the opportunity to sit in front of, you know, Tonino Lamborghini. He and I just went to, uh, uh, what was it, India last year and got honorary degrees. We got to go to all the universities. It was unbelievable. Tens of thousands of students. Wow. Spectacular. And he taught me a great thing. It's in that book right there, Wealth Made Easy. I said, how did you and your dad create so much wealth and prosperity? And he said, all you got to do is create a product, good, or service that people will save their money to happily hand it over to you. For that experience. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, no one's going to save their money to buy your book, Greg. He goes, but they'll cash in their 401k to drive our car. Yeah. And he goes, no one's going to spend three, dollars $4,000 a night to live in their own apartment, but you'll go to Anaheim and give it to a mouse with big ears all day long. <laughs> it is so true. And so how do you create, how do people better create that experience? Do you have any insight on that? Yeah, what's common sense to you is genius to someone else, right? Here's an experience. I'll give you an example. How many spectators, minus your crew, do you have sitting around us right now? A lot. Well, the whole idea is that the more people that you can surround yourselves with and have them share that experience, you can be rewarded for it. How do you find a way to get paid money to do what you're already going to do? Here's a little fun fact. When I did Three Feet from Gold, one of my biggest best-selling books, I invited 350 people to come with me to interview all those people. Wow. No one showed up. What? No one. So Nobody. And then everyone had something called the bad case of the one size. That means I go once I get the big break or once I get the money. And their big butt held them back. Not the one they sit on, but I'd go do that. But I have to. Exactly. But I have to water my plant. But I have to. The, their big butts and the one size. Wow. So it's the, Love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So one of the other big things is how 
did you kind of connect with all these one percent? Because you really are. You're interviewing the one percenters mm. of the entire world. Some of the most powerful, influential people. Getting that interview with them, how are you going about that? And how can a lot of people are just very yeah. intimidating with reaching out to them? And I myself am personally finding more. It's like all those people are intimidated, so that's why, as long as you give them a definitive plan, they're going to be more likely to reach out. Well, but, two, two ways one, specificity. Okay. I sit there and very specific and say, listen, you know, I want to come interview for a new book I'm working on, like Wealth Made Easy. In 12.5 minutes from the time I show up to the time I leave, I'm going to ask you one question. Give me one you know, wealth act that you did to create a life of sustained abundance. After that, you can kick me out or we can continue the interview. Chance of them giving me 12.5 minutes goes through the roof. But here's the big news flash: The most successful people are also the most available people. I know it sounds weird. But if you're brand new at something, you're happy-go-lucky, you're fresh, you're cool. If you're at the pinnacle, happy-go-lucky, nothing to prove. In the middle, pain in the neck. You're filled with ego. You're edging God out. It's easier to get to the founder of Remax Real Estate Billion Dollar Corporation than your local Remax office down the street. Which is crazy. It's the truth. Wow. Whoa. Dropping some bombs here. Yeah, I'm still trying to kind of digest all that because it just seems, like you say, common sense, but most people will never go out and go do that. Well, we're in a world of accessibility more than ever before. I mean, right now through, you know, direct messages on Instagram and, you know, LinkedIn, and Twitter and things like that, that's how I get access to all these people. People go, you know, what's your big secret? It's this new thing out called Google. Don't tell anybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> but everything's out there. GTS. I know. Shh, don't That's tell what anyone. every single time my kids are like, I, GTS. I say, Google that shit. Mm-hmm. Now it's more like YouTube that shit. That's because right. Anything you want to learn, like 100%, is on YouTube. It's funny. My mentor, Charlie Tremendous Jones, had a quote. He says that you're the same today as you'll be in five years, except for two things. The people you meet in the books you read. And today it's, you're the same today as you'll be in five years, except for the people you meet and the information and content that you absorb. My son's seven years old. He can't read, but he's the smartest guy I know because he learned everything on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I like, I'm kind of a hybrid for, I love reading, but I'm also a very visual guy. So YouTube really resonates with me. But then when I'm driving, just picking up gold nuggets and podcasts all the time. And it's just the amount of time, I think it was, this was Jim Rowan was saying like the amount of time you drive in a car you can get a phd just Absolutely listening to true. podcasts because i'm in my car i would say an hour minimum of a day i think it was brian around. tracy he was always oh, talking right, there you yeah they arrived by uh, you know uh, B- what is it mba that's it one of those exactly how do you spell mba that is a good question <laughs> so born and raised del mar what was it like growing up back West in Coast. Uh, you said grew up there in the 60s yeah, 60s, 70s, Del Mar, my whole life. So I've grown up in Del Mar, La Jolla. I live up in Carlsbad, Carlsbad right, right now. So, yeah, it's the mean streets of the beach life. You know how it is. It's so funny. I'm 56 years old, and I still skateboard every single day. Isn't that wild? Yeah, that, that is spectacular. And how kind of has San Diego, because I wasn't even born in the 60s, so I'm more familiar with I how it I is I think I just now. got called old. In I, I didn't say that. I don't take it that way. Knowledgeable. Thank Knowledgeable. You very much. Wisdom. Wisdom. Them. Very, very, very That's wise. It. But so, things have changed. It's like any town you go to. Look, you go back, you know, it's like back to the future, right? And it's completely different than the way you remembered it as a child. On the same note, I like progress. You know? I do too. Yeah, so I lived in a little town called Del Mar. It was a very little beach town back in the day. And across the street, which is now Carmel Valley, that was non existent. When I was 16 years old and they started doing development, I would go steal all the uh, you know, spark plugs out of the tractors to, so they can't build <laughs> on my land. But uh, when I became an adult and they were auctioning off the you know, houses, I was the first guy on the list trying to buy my million dollar estate. So go figure. That's too funny. And it, we, I was just saying the same thing when we were, I'm from Rancho San Diego. It used to be, all be like cow farms and yeah. just farmland everywhere. And now it, it's amazing. It's an amazing part of town. So. Oh, love it. So, again, thank you so much. So, Wealth Made Easy, what kind of inspired you to write this? Well, it's interesting. I got a divorce about four years ago, and I've got the greatest ex-wife in the world. I know it sounds strange, but I love my ex-wife. She's amazing. She's a great mom to my kid, too. And uh, we we're separating everything up, and I go, man, after all these books, I should have more dough. And I, I realized all my books were stickability, don't quit, perseverance, kumbaya, but they weren't about making dough. So I called up my first billionaire friend. I said, will you teach me how you made your money? I go, absolutely. And I said, why would you teach me that? And he says, no one ever asked me. 
He goes, really? my grandkids are fighting over my inheritance and I'm still alive. My family's fighting in the business, but no one asked how I accomplished it. And I sat him down and he taught me at the simplest step. You want to hear what he said? Time plus land is wealth. And he says, all I do is look for a town anywhere in the world that's growing exponentially at 25% a year. I look for Broadway Main Street and I draw a line out eight miles and I buy the dirt. I rent the dirt to farmers, they pay the lease so it's free to me and I get vegetables for years. As the town continues to grow at 25%, it ends up on my plot. Since I'm on Broadway and Main Street, that's what I sell to the big box stores for 800 times what I paid, billion dollars. Wow. And that's how he made his billion. Yes. And then from there, he introduced me to his other billionaire friends. And then they interviewed me and sent me on to their billionaire friends. And then from there and there and there, that's how it all happened. Gotcha. So what are the top three you'd say? I, I think that one's genius. And I, that one is one that really, really resonated with me. The Lamborghini one, which you already brought up, is people are all about experience. I'm going to answer your question. You CPC. But it did not come from a billionaire. It came from a good friend of mine that I had to put inside there. Okay. And CPC... And when people understand this simple concept will change your life forever. CPC stands for Clues, Patterns, Choices. Okay. Say it again. Clues, Patterns, Choices. It's about Take accountability notes. and responsibility for everything that happens to us. It's not other people's fault. I'll give you an example. I go out on a first date. She's 20 minutes late. That's a clue. I go on the second and third date. She's 20 minutes late. That's a pattern. pattern. Well, now it's my choice to deal with it, address it break up with them or whatever, but it's not her fault. She's just late. That's who she is. That's just her. Think me. about it. How many times have you seen someone cheat one of your friends in business, they have a bad reputation, and then cheat someone that's close to you, then you do a business and get cheated on, and you're mad at that person. You saw the clues, patterns, but you still made Even that Even though choice. you've already been witnessing all Correct. of that happen for so long, and then you resent them for it, which is crazy, because that's just... It's like watching a rattlesnake rattle, bite your best friend, and then you pet it and get bit, and you're mad at the snake. When they're just doing their natural thing. Exactly. It's your choice. Wow. Okay. Well, again, I'm kind of at a loss of words. You dropped so many bombs. If you are watching this, I highly recommend watching this once or twice because just those nuggets, and that's what I love about your books, is just it's so easy to digest, and you can kind of knock these things out in you right. know, one or two hours. What's really good is that I'm not that smart. So <laughs> we write. But you surround yourself by people yes, that are we, way smarter. But we also write in a simplistic way that everyone can understand. Look, if you can't understand wealth, prosperity, happiness, success in a soundbite, then you can't be qualified to teach it and share it to other people. I agree. And so what are, what are some of the big things that you're trying to, because I have a couple kids too as well. What are you trying to instill that some of the core values? Um, oh, and my kid? It? Yeah. Oh, my, you know, we learn everything from our children. I have a seven-year-old son. Uh, last year at the age of six, when he was a kid, he had the number one spoken album on Amazon, just so you know. And he's going for a best of number one back-to-back -back this year with his new album coming out, wow. just so you know. And, it's and what do you mean by spoken album? Well, he did is a, he has this mantra. And he said, my name's Colt. I'm happy, powerful, successful. I'm worthy. I'm wealthy. I help people. And then we put it to, like, hip-hop music, and it became a sensation. What? Yeah. In fact, he's got his own Spotify channel. Colt Reed. Yeah, go check it out. I am definitely going to check that out. <laughs> <laughs> Colt Baker, right? That's what it is. His latest one's called I'm the Businessman. And so that's his latest thing. Wow. So you kind of helped nudge him in that right direction to do nope. this? It or? was his idea. All I do is whatever I find something that he likes to do, I feed him more of it. Gotcha. Look, if I give him something that, like, tell him to play the piano he doesn't want, I'm not going to force it. I'm going to work his strengths and then hire the weaknesses. That's it. Question. Okay, so I agree. So I'm all very, very big on exposing my kids to as many things as possible. But sometimes they, they like it, and I tell they're good at it. But then they get some kind of adversity to where it gets a little bit tough, and mm. they don't have that stick ability. How do, are you pushing? You know, adults is one thing. There's no excuse. Like you just got to do it. Man up. Take care. But of as it. a kid, they don't have to do it. Okay. That's my answer. But they what don't if you know it's it. something that they love, and they just are quitting because? I haven't had that circumstance oh. yet. I mean, my kid makes his bed. He's, he's here. I haven't had a challenge yet. The whole thing, though, again, is that I make sure that I reward the things he loves. I'll give you an example. I was doing one of these podcasts, and someone said, do you give your kid an allowance? I go, absolutely. Every week he earns this thing. And they go, oh, that's a shame. Really? Why? Mm -hmm. And that's what I asked. And they said, because you're training your son. The only way to make money is to do something that they don't like. He goes, that's what you're training your kid since he's a child. And I went, holy smokes, boom. 
And then I went to my kid and said, hey, I'm working on my cell phone. I'm trying to get this app download. I want to do these cool TikToks. I will you do them for me? And he did. And I started paying him money for that. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, he started getting rewarded for doing what he loved to do. And I says, by living here, though, we should make our bed and do the lawn. We should do these things as our contribution. But you're not going to get rewarded for it. That's just what you do. You get rewarded for the, your talents and skill sets. Change the whole paradigm. And by the way, he's got $28,000 in Bitcoin right now at seven years old because he bought low and sells. There you go. Oh, I know. So he's doing something right. He's doing at something right. Seven years old. Yeah, because he's following the successful actions of others. And he's following the patterns and the trends, and and well, it sounds like you are. You got to teach him, though. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, just the other day when Ethereum, you know, was going at a peak, he calls me up, says, "Got to sell." I go, "Why?" He goes, "Buy low, sell high." It's at peaking. Sure enough, and just went down, you know, eighteen percent. He was a brilliant guy. Gotcha. That's incredible. So he is very, very into that, and he's just naturally drawn to that, and. I, again, them. work your strengths, hire your weaknesses. That's my whole philosophy. Look, I am absolutely horrible at mowing the lawn, so I got a great guy to help me with that one, right? I cannot write myself out of paper bag, so I hire the best ghostwriters in the world. The person who wrote that book with me, Gary Krebs, he's the former publisher of McGraw-Hill Publishing Corporation in New York City. Who can write a better book, me or that guy, right? Yeah. Uh, when you look at it, the same thing, stickability, the guy who wrote that with me, right, wrote all the curriculum for Princeton University. That's the way it's done. So you're just going to the top. That's it. And you're partnering with the best, most affluential people. Work your strengths, hire your weaknesses. I think it's time to wrap it up. I think so too, my man. Well, thank you so much. If people want to kind of reach out to you, follow you on Instagram, what's your thing? Yeah, Greg S. Reed on Instagram. In fact, if you send me a DM, uh, I respond to everybody, but here's the rule. I don't want to talk about what you ate for dinner, your family, friends, the weather, but if you got a specific question or a contact that you need, reach out to me. I'd be glad to uh, respond right away. Perfect. I love it. Done. Thanks so much for tuning in to Waz Up San Diego. So grateful to have Greg Reed on the show. That man is an incredible storyteller. If you have any questions, make sure you check out his Instagram at Greg S. Reed. If you have any questions for me or suggestions for guests, feel free to shoot me an email at wazupsandiego at gmail.com. I will see you next week.